return your call. It's a Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Not too bad. Can you, Christine's here too. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you, no problem. Great. Just wanted to make sure our volume on our mic was loud enough. Perfect. Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Awesome. We probably won't have the video on, so I think this should work. Um, whenever you want me to share the screen, just let me know and we can go from there. Most definitely. I think the way it's going to work is I'm going to introduce y'all. I just got my video on now, so it's not like you're talking to an apparition while we get started. <laughs> sure. Um, and then, yeah, I'll introduce you. Um, I'm going to record the meeting, um, and then I'll stop the record, uh, the recording right before the question and answer session, um, just to protect everyone's privacy when they do ask questions. Okay, great. And then, um, other than that, yeah, it'll all be up to you. I don't know when people can start tuning in. Um, yeah, from other the session that I went to, usually by five minutes in, a few people are starting to trickle in. Okay. That sounds good. So how y'all doing? You have a good holiday weekend? Yeah, it was quiet. How about yours? also quiet I, was, I don't know not about to go out right now personally. yeah exactly yeah since this is the today right now convocation is about to start at my institution so this is like the first day of classes for us oh okay right on it just so happens that i found the session at the same time so <laughs> busy day then <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot you, had, you were missing convocation to do this. Mm -hmm. All right, 
I'm going to go ahead and mute my video since folks are coming in. Do you have like a title slide or something you could throw up? Yeah, we can go ahead and put that up. Okay, that'll be good. And then I figure I'll wait one or two minutes. Um, make sure if there's any like, you know, last minute folks trickling in and then I'll start introducing y'all if that's okay. Yeah, sounds that good. sounds great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me close my email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think just the whole thing. Okay, there's that. Hopefully you can see that okay now. Yeah, it looks good on my end. All right, awesome, thanks. Andrew Barber, I'm an MLIS student at the University of Arizona. Today we have um, Christine Moeller and Roberto Arteaga um, presenting on uh, librarians in the classroom. I'll give a quick bio and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, some quick rules. Um, I will be recording the presentation uh, section of um, their session and then when it comes time for discussion at the end, I will turn the recording off. Everyone who's participating right now has been muted and then up until that time I will turn, uh, when it's time for discussion, I will turn on the ability for you all to unmute yourself if you would like to ask questions. You may also ask questions in the chat and I'll keep a tally of those and ask them at the beginning of the discussion session. So until recently, Christine M. Moeller worked as an academic librarian and regularly led faculty development sessions on inclusive pedagogies and transparent teaching. She is now a PhD student at the University of Washington iSchool, where she will be researching neurodiversity in library workplaces. Roberto is an academic librarian in the Pacific Northwest. His research interests include critical information literacy, instructional design, and e-learning. Off work, he listens to a lot of music and tries to find time to play video games and read comics. I'm going to hand it off to them now. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, we'd like to start with special thanks to Andrew for being our moderator and to the whole CLAPS committee for all the work they put in under difficult circumstances to make this conference possible. Today we are presenting from the ancestral homelands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, and Puyallup peoples, as well as other Coast Salish peoples and their descendants. We recognize that no land acknowledgement can in and of itself be an adequate method for addressing settler colonialism, but we see this statement as a call to action to educate ourselves, support these communities, and take concrete steps to collaborate in dismantling systemic oppression. We also recognize that the conversation we are about to have about power in libraries is particularly complicated for our Black, Indigenous, and people of color colleagues and all those whose identities continue to be marginalized within the field of librarianship. Our hope is that we can make some space today for each of us to reclaim some power so we can lead in our own way, no matter how our title or position identifies us. We thank all of you for making time and space to join this conversation. The slides and additional documentation will be available following today's workshop, so feel free to come and go today as needed. Now, I know already we're already introduced, but as a reminder, my name is Christine Moeller, and I'm moving from being a librarian, an instruction librarian to being a PhD student. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Roberto Arteaga, and I'm an instruction and reference librarian at Pacific Lutheran University, where I worked with Christine up to a few weeks ago. When Roberto and I worked to adapt to this workshop for an online format instead of in person as originally planned, we chose to focus on opportunities for reflection instead of group discussion. Our goal for today is to help all of you reflect on some of the structural forces that impact your own work and leave with notes and ideas that you can return to whenever necessary or helpful for your teaching. With that in mind, then, we will begin with a reflection activity. 
We will ask you to share your response through an online poll, which we'll put up in a moment, but you should also make a note for yourself, or you can add it to your zine if you were able to print a copy of that and have it with you now. We will also have several more reflection activities, so if you don't have a doc open or a notepad handy, you'll have an opportunity to grab that in a moment. Uh, so our first reflection question is this. So what is one common question or phrase you have encountered when reaching out to instructors or departments? Uh, like us, you may commonly hear questions like, can I, can you take my class live at a conference? Or something like the title of this session, do I have to have a librarian come to my class? Once you have spent some time thinking about this question, select a question or phrase of your choice from what you have written down and submit it to our online poll. Uh, be aware that there's a character limit, so you may need to shorten your response a bit. We'll give everyone a few minutes to reflect, respond, and to reflect and respond. And don't forget to jot down uh, things for yourself as well. We'll display the responses as they are entered so you can follow along and we'll give you a 30 second reminder when we're about to move on. All right, so here, forthcoming in just a second, here's the information about the online poll. Um, so you can see at the top there, you can go to menti.com and use that code um, to enter your response and we'll give everyone a few minutes to do that. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> I'll try for you in eight minutes. Ouch.
All right, so we'll give you about 30 more seconds. It looks like we've had quite a lot of responses. So we'll give you a moment to finish up um, and then we will move on. All right, thank you for all of these responses. Um, they were, some of these hurt. Um, they, we have experienced many of these as well, um, which I'm sure doesn't surprise any of you. Um, there are many common experiences here. Um, if you've been watching, you probably saw some other ones that you have, may have experienced at your workplace as well. Um, now that we've asked everyone to identify some of these questions and responses, we'd like to dig in and examine these responses a little more closely. Um, it sounds like a cat may be joining us too, so if you hear mewing in the background, uh, please don't mind that. <laughs> Um, so you may not be surprised to hear that many of the same kinds of questions and phrases that you all shared have also come up for us again and again across multiple institutions in various locations across the U.S. So in examining these common questions and phrases, we found both explicit and implicit references to the service model of librarianship. As the name implies, the service model assumes that the purpose of libraries is to provide service or services. Librarians themselves tend to value this orientation towards service, and thus service is often considered to be the essence of librarianship, as noted in a 2014 study by Deborah Hicks. This orientation toward libraries as service is further emphasized by its inclusion in the ALA core values of librarianship which declares that, quote, we provide the highest level of service to all library users. The service model of librarianship did not emerge out of the ether, but rather represents both historical and contemporary imaginings of what the library has been and can be. Historically speaking, early public libraries were aligned with the goals of white supremacy and their mission to civilize and reform the masses, or in other words, to help assimilate white immigrants. Libraries also, as Jim Elmborg notes, supported the quote, reading needs of the elite class who would rule the masses. White women were employed as librarians to take on this work of social missionary, or what Gina Schleselman Tarango identifies as the Lady Bountiful archetype, all while being expected to exhibit stereotypically feminine traits, such as care and nurturing others. In academic libraries, librarians were seen as support for the scholarly and pedagogical work of the historically, again, white male faculty. Within the field of librarianship, including hiring practices, much emphasis was placed on being patient, helpful, and pleasant to patrons, or in other words, on serving the emotional needs of others. Today, librarians often identify the service orientation as a reason for joining the profession or as a value that defines their work. This service for others is perceived to be intrinsically good and like other aspects of librarianship, largely remains unquestioned. While performing this service for the benefit of others, library workers are still expected to perform both reproductive and emotional labor. Roxanne Shirazi has written about the reproductive labor of librarians, noting that academic librarians continually, quote, perform labor that re reproduces the academy, such as teaching information literacy or other research skills. The extent to which emotional labor is a professional expectation is clear from the RUSA guidelines for behavioral performance of reference and information providers, which stress the importance of being approachable, friendly, making eye contact, demonstrating interest in the needs of the patron, and communicating in a, quote, receptive, cordial, and supportive manner. These guidelines indicate that the emotional needs of the patron supersede the needs of any individual library worker. Thus, the emotional and reproductive labor of librarians is not valued in the same way as the work of teaching faculty, 
nor, as Lisa Slonowski observes in an article from 2016, is this labor viewed as intellectual labor, but is instead seen as administrative support. I saw that in a lot of the, the phrases that you all shared with us. This labor is also largely dependent upon the work of others, including the curriculum, coursework, and even individual assignments produced by faculty. Since you may already be thinking about the service model at your library, we're going to pause here for another reflection activity. So go ahead and take a moment to reflect on what the service model of librarianship looks like at your place of work. You may want to focus on somewhat tangible signs of the service model in action. For example, the first item in our library's vision statement declares that the library is, quote, committed to excellence in service. And the first goal in the mission is to, quote, provide quality customer service. Additionally, until a few years ago, faculty, not librarians, were in charge of all collection development for each discipline. Librarians were only allowed to make purchases and make the materials available, and they didn't have the power or the ability to question any of the collection development decisions made by faculty. So obviously these are examples that are specific to our institution, but you probably have similar examples at your place of work. So let's have everyone take a few minutes to jot down some notes. Um, we do have an optional online poll this time. So if you have a moment and you wanna pop your response in there, you're welcome to do that. And if you have the zine, this is on page three. So again, we'll continue in about three to four minutes and we'll give you a 30 second reminder when we're about to come back. And here is the information for the online poll. Wow, customer service training. Yeah, we have similar feelings, I think, about the one shot. Oh, that's what give them the pickle is. Yeah, definitely have not had to do any customer service training myself, but I can see that happening in some institutions. All right, thank you for all these responses, everyone. We'll start to move on in another 
30 seconds or so. And thank you again for all these responses. Yeah, so much vocational law. Oof. All right, thank you again for all those responses. We're gonna move on, but hold on to those responses. We'll come back to them in a bit. But now that we have established a few examples and talked about the service model of librarianship, as well as what it looks like in your particular context, we're going to narrow the focus a bit more and talk about library instruction specifically. So as Christine mentioned, librarians have historically been in charge with educating the masses of the behest of the elites and to acculturate them into US slash white culture. And library instruction, which is often presumed to be yet another service provided by the library is no different. In this case, librarians are in charge of acculturating students into the world of academic research and library instruction is another request of the faculty who are the elites in this example. Uh, even under these conditions, it should be possible to develop a comprehensive library instruction program that is able to assess the students' progress throughout their academic career in regards to information literacy. The reality, however, is that many library instruction programs seem to be tangential and not essential to first-year experience or general education programs. Librarians are there because faculty believe that students need to learn about the library, and as you can expect, there is little agreement about how to do this or what this looks like. And without that common understanding, library instruction programs aren't able, aren't able to clearly de define the scope of their work. Now, it may be that your institution is right ahead of mine, but, and for that, I really applaud you and those that made it happen because I really don't imagine that was an easy thing to do. However, in my time as a teaching librarian, it's always been clear to me that my authority and power are limited and that I have to carve out space for my work. So how can I realistically meet the goals that I have set for our instruction program? Or how can I prepare students for lives of inquiry and lifelong learning? To begin to answer these questions, I want to talk about the new Dewey and Snedden debate from the 1910s in which John Dewey and David Snedden presented their different perspectives on the future of education. So I bring up this debate, which Dewey allegedly lost because the same forces that stirred the debate between these two figures are still raging today. On one side, we have those who like Snedden are interested in meeting the needs of the market and for whom education is about the development of workplace skills. And on the other side, we have those who want education to be a liberatory experience that places emphasis on lifelong learning. And it is also important to point out that Snedden worked with administrators and wanted to make good laborers, while Dewey worked with educators and was interested in educating socially responsible citizens. And this same dichotomy is what we encounter, but sometimes in a larger, sometimes in a smaller scale, when we do library instruction. In other words, teaching librarians are always torn between the needs of a curriculum that focus on creating value in between our own vocational aspirations. And this conflict of interest plays out differently at the programmatic level and at the personal level. Uh, at the programmatic level, this leads to situations where librarians are constantly accommodating the needs of others. So think of the bad requests, disguised as collaborations that we often take on, or the last minute sessions that we agree to do because we may not see a group of students ever again. And one aspect of this dynamic can be explained with the dichotomy presented by the Snewy and Snedden and Dewey debate, where our need to help students become informed citizens meets the need of the market, and we are forced to make a choice. And this choice is one that, all, that others don't often experience the same way that teaching librarians do. After all, instructors are also beholden to a curriculum set by their departments and accreditors 
where the difference lies is in the inherent value given to faculty work, which is most often seen as propri proprietary in the work of librarians, which is, seen as a, which is seen as a service that is demarcated by the needs of others. Uh, how, this, how this dynamic plays out will vary from institution to institution, but regardless of your title, the work that librarians do is often perceived as magical and generally misunderstood. Uh, at the personal level, many of these issues are still present and often amplified. Although the impact is not always immediately apparent, over time as an, and as a result of the constant need to pivot in order to meet the demands of others, the burden of all the emotional and visible labor that we do begins to build and may result in burnout. And this is yet another impact of power imbalances in our work. After all, when we engage in a transactional approach to education, we are selling out not just our values, but our, but our expertise as educators and as librarians. Take, for example, my institution. So up to a few years ago, and as Christine mentioned, faculty were in charge of making purchasing decisions for the collection. What resulted was a highly specialized collection for a small liberal arts college that is quite difficult to update and sometimes use. And now fast forward to the present, right before the pandemic, uh, librarians are now in control of collection development and want to create a more student-centered collection that reflects the research interests of students, but they are still met with unrealistic demands and research assignments that do not take into consideration the realities of the collection, nor the students' research interests. Um, this is just one of the examples that I could give in addition to those that you've already shared with us. Uh, what happens or where these experiences lead depends very much on your context, but either way, the personal impact cannot be ignored. This may seem bleak right now, but we believe that unless we are willing to recognize the harm that is being caused through our work, we won't be able to transition into a place of power. In asking you to reflect on difficult circumstances, we hope you can simultaneously identify some positive paths forward. Uh, to help you do that, we have uh, two more reflection questions. So first, we'd like you to identify what underlying assumptions and cultural practices you think may influence the questions and phrases you regularly hear from faculty. So for example, at my institution, so faculty governance is particularly strong there and faculty are given a wide authority and freedom to pursue their work as they wish. Um, so they tend to assume that teaching faculty are the only experts on campus. And librarians who also hold faculty status aren't generally included in this category. So for this question, it may be helpful to focus on broad, potentially structural issues or concerns rather than the thoughts or attitudes of individuals. Uh, once you've identified similar assumptions at your institution, we'd like you to consider the impact of those assumptions on your work, or the work of your unit. And to continue with our collection development example, so even though librarians now are in charge of collection development, the authority and expertise to do that work has not been reclaimed yet. So only teaching faculty are seen as experts and librarians are seen as real faculty despite having the status. Uh, unfortunately, many of us probably experience this to some degree. So make sure to know whatever experiences seem important at your institution. And if you're following along with the zine, we are now on pages four and five. We'll give you about five minutes to write down your thoughts on these two questions, and then we'll move on to the next part. And let me switch back to the first question here. Uh, once about two, three minutes have passed, I'll switch to the next question. And then we'll give you a 30 second warning when we're close to being done here.
And here's the other question. Hey, Roberto, are participants supposed to be uh, answering these questions in Menti or writing these down for their own personal notes? Uh, this is just for their personal notes. The, the only first couple of questions were the ones we had in the poll because these are more uh, personal to each individual. We wanted to keep those for themselves. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Sorry if that wasn't clear, everyone. Okay, we'll give you about 30 more seconds and then I'll, I'll move on from these questions. Okay, so realistically, we recognize that very few of us have the individual power to change the assumptions and cultural practices that you have all written down. Rather, it's important to explore the full context of our work so we can work through or around problematic practices and assumptions. Breaking the cycles that have been around since or before this net and undue debate will not happen overnight. And in order to begin some of that work, it is necessary that we all identify the power loops that keep us from doing the work that needs to be done and identify where those, bricks, where those loops can be broken. Uh, to quote Emily Drabinsky, we must identify our places of power and organize that power for the good of others. What this looks like will of course be different for everyone here, but the focus should always be on building, supporting and sustaining our communities. Uh, figuring out ways to figuring out figure, figuring out ways to work from within or from outside the power loops that holds us back requires a firm foundation, both personal and professional. We want you to recognize that you do have power when it comes to your own work and library instruction. In order to wield that power, it helps to know who you are and what matters to you because that's where you can begin to claim power and continue to do your work in a way that hopefully avoids burnout. And that's how we want to proceed today, by outlining a set of practices that we hope help you define your practice and also your identity as a teacher so you can identify the places of power, your places of power, organize that power, and break some of these power imbalances. I don't think either Roberto or I would claim that we have broken any power loops at our institution, but by knowing ourselves and our work, we have been able to sidestep those power loops to create some spaces for more meaningful work. We have both been able to do that through what we are calling critical pedagogical praxis. So what is this? For today's discussion, this is an individual practice that can help in the conceptualization of your identity as a teacher, that one that is grounded in the scholarship of teaching and learning, and it aims to empower teaching librarians and their practice. The word praxis here implies some intentional interweaving of theory and practice, but this is really a way to envision the work of teaching librarians. As you can see, there are four components here. Each component informs the others, so these all work together. And remember, what this looks like will be different for everyone, so there's no one right way to define your work and labor. The first component is the teaching statement. This can be a formal philosophy statement, or it can be a simple list of the practices that are important to you as an educator, such as inclusive teaching. 
What matters is that you have identified the assumptions and values you hold about teaching and learning. The second component is the intentional design of instruction. This is of course informed by your teaching philosophy, but it also draws on all of the situational factors for your teaching, such as student identities and characteristics, instructional goals, and the curricular context. In order to empower students to be active agents in their own learning process, librarians must be able to articulate how they make decisions about what and how they are teaching. This level of transparency is essential for effectively communicating the purpose and goals of any library instruction. The third component is learner-centered teaching, which basically means teaching to the students who are actually in the room and involving them in the learning process rather than imposing learning upon them. This often means sharing power in the classroom in order to help students develop their own process for meaning making. And the final component is reflection. This may mean taking note of what worked well and what didn't, or where students had questions, but this also means reflecting on your own goals, expectations, and attitudes toward teaching so you can adjust and revise as appropriate. But remember that reflection should also be a positive practice rather than focusing solely on the negative. By incorporating reflection into our instruction and adopting it as an important habit, we can also identify how our teaching has been effective or has improved. Over the years, Roberto and I have both found that our familiarity with our own pedagogical praxis has opened metaphorical doors that might have remained closed otherwise. Despite not making much progress toward a programmatic approach to information literacy instruction, we have been able to make use of our pedagogy to disrupt some dominant practices and to advocate for our own knowledge and expertise. In this way, our pedagogy has served as a form of self-advocacy. We do want to acknowledge that people may be taking a risk when they step up and do this, and it may require additional labor. For example, Roberto is now on a number of committees, and I was asked to lead a number of faculty development opportunities. But of course, these also have given us new opportunities for advocacy work. We also know that the work of librarians is often invisible and bringing attention to yourself might put you in a precarious situation so only you can decide if this risk is worth it. We ourselves have attempted to mitigate some of this risk by being careful about when and with whom we engage and trying to make those decisions in a way that is consistent with both our professional and personal identities. For us, that has been essential to figuring out where we might use our power for the good of others, as Emily Drabinsky advised. We have included a few additional pedagogy-related reflection questions for you in the zine, which will remain available on the CLAPS website. We hope that what we have presented here today either helps you continue or begin to explore your own pedagogical practices and discover ways to explore pedagogy as advocacy at your own institutions. We know that what works for us may not work for everyone or for every context, but we hope you feel free to adapt to this as appropriate for your needs. To some degree, what we shared today was our way of making meaning out of difficult situations and trying to do our work with sometimes little or no support. In, the, in a way, this framework of sorts has become the foundation of our work and how we have survived and carved out opportunities to thrive so we could use what little power we do have for the benefit of others. Uh, if you're curious about whether this is applicable on a larger scale, we are trying to do this at a programmatic level at our institution. Um, then the pandemic happened, but we do hope to explore this a bit further at a presentation is, which was accepted to Wheelie 2021. Uh, further details about this are still forthcoming, but we hope to see you there as well. Uh, for now, though, we'd be happy to respond to questions about today's presentation. Uh, be sure to submit your question to the chat, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And as a reminder, we'll be using the guidelines for questions here during the opening keynote, which we have here on this slide. So before you submit your question, we ask that you give it a quick review using these questions as guidance. 
We will also review the questions, trying to be mindful of the limited time uh, that we have remaining. So if we don't get to your question, please uh, don't take that personally. Uh, we'll take a moment to catch our breath now and look over the questions submitted thus far. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording and then we will begin the Q&A session once you all have had a moment to breathe, get some water, relax. <laughs> Thank you.